Yes, we're going to talk about networking. This is probably um, the single most important skill that you will need coming out of Bloomsburg University or any other interior school. Like, you will need this skill more than anything. So I'm hoping that this presentation will help get you ready um, for getting started. Um, first, networking by definition here. A supportive system of information and services among people with a common interest. And maybe not even common, you'll be surprised um, how many links you have with people that you don't even realize. Um, it will stay common just because that's the great definition that I found online, but I do think that sometimes you don't have a common interest with someone and are still able to network with them. Um, what are some of your definitions of networking? That's mine, but what, are, what, are, what do you all think of when you think of networking? Tell me, you can just throw it out there. Yes. Social interaction. Social interaction, absolutely. It's the, the basics of it. Others? Nate? Uh, opening opportunities. Ooh, opening opportunities, absolutely. What else? Networking. When I say networking, what pops in your head? Making connections. Making connections, absolutely. Those are right. Social opportunities, connecting, those things are all synonymous with networking. Um, the important thing to know about networking is that it's a action, not a reaction. So you actually have to physically do something in order for networking to happen. It's not a passive process. So you don't get to sit down, you don't get to come to conferences like these and just sit down and hope that networking will come to you. You have to actually do something. You, your body has to move, your mouth has to move. And that's important to know. It's also not fast. And that's important. I think that we think in our mind, um, and you may even hear, hear from people like myself or other staff say, just network, just network. Well, you, yeah, just network, but it's not fast. Networking is slow. It's gradual. It builds. It's like you don't just go do it and it happens. Like, there are steps to it. The networking relationship takes time. It takes action. You have to really invest in it. And it's also very habitual. Um, it, we'll talk about it in this presentation, but it's not just a single thing that you do. It's something that you continue to build upon. What are some of the apprehensions that you have? If I tell you, from, if, if say there was a, a dinner after this, this uh, workshop, if there was a dinner, and I said to you, go network at that dinner, what would be some of the first apprehensions that come into your head? Yeah. How to like, first approach the people. How to approach people, OK. Yeah. Uh -huh. Kind of scaring the person you're trying to network with away by being overly aggressive. Very good. Being aware of your social cues. Very good. What else? Apprehensions. These are excellent. You should be able to. The timing, like before or after dinner or during? When? <coughs> when? Yeah, when. That's the basic. Uh huh. Your projection. Oh, it's my personal worst. My personal worst. Yeah. Were you gonna say something? No. No. Okay. <coughs> Any other apprehensions? <coughs> No? Okay. Um, the N-word. Rejection. No. Hearing no. Right? Absolutely. These are ones that I came up with. So, so far, we're one and one, right? Um, I do not like hearing no at all, but I will tell you how to overcome that. Um, someone said, not wanting to overwhelm the person that you're talking to, meaning you're not sure what to say. That, that's a very common apprehension. You don't know what to say. You've got the person in front of you. You know they can help you, but you don't know what to say to them. Um, or maybe you don't have the person in front of you. Maybe there are 40 people in the room, but you don't know who you need to talk to. We had a networking um, opportunity down in the um, multicultural center, and there were several great alumni to talk to there, but you may not have been sure who you needed to reach out to, who you should target, or you, you all, your group may not have gone down there yet. Um, and, or, or something like me, just being downright afraid of looking silly. No one mentioned that. I, I may be the only person that's afraid of looking like a fool. But that, for me, is I, I, just, I just don't like to look like an, an, an idiot. And when you're nervous about something, it can happen. Um, I have a couple of ways to overcome those, those apprehensions that I'm going to go over with you. Um, one of them is a quote by Albert Einstein. I've heard it said so many different ways. But if you always do what you've done, you'll always have what you've got, and you'll always feel what you felt. Right? If what's working, if what you're doing now is working for you, then keep doing it, because nothing will ever change. Nothing. In class, if you are doing very well, getting A's, then what you're doing is working for you. If you're getting C's and D's, 
but you continue to do what you're doing now, you will continue to get C's and D's in your personal relationships. If your communication is poor, you can't figure out why you and your partner keep fighting, but you're not doing anything to change it, you will continue to see the same results if you do the same thing. Ben Franklin, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over yet expecting a different result. How many of you have done that at some point somewhere in your life? Every hand in this room should be up. I mean, you just do the same thing. I believe strongly, strongly, that I could continue to eat unlimited amount. Okay, there was a point in my life where I ate, where I had ate a gluten-filled diet. Then I had to go gluten-free. So I thought that I could replace all of the gluten-filled stuff with the gluten-free version and still feel amazing. That just meant that I ate gluten-free Oreos and <laughs> gluten-free cake. It, it, it was still a terrible diet. I just replaced one vice for another. And then I was like, why am I not feeling better? Well, it's because I'm still eating crap. I'm just eating gluten-free crap. So <laughs> it's still crap at the end of the day. It's still completely inhuman food with no semblance of, of you know, real food in the line. Um, and then a quote that my husband gave me from a comedian that he likes, Mike Epps. Sometimes you gotta do something strange for a little piece of change. You know, sometimes you have to do that because it requires, because networking requires you to do something. Sometimes you have to do something that you're not comfortable doing or you're not familiar with. So my fellow friend that is not um, fond of hearing the word no, this is how you can overcome some rejections with hearing the word no. Um, my motto, and the owls hear this all the time, if you ask for something, and you are told no, you are in the same position you were in before you asked. So you haven't lost anything. You've lost nothing. What have you lost? You didn't have it before. You don't have it now. But you're in the same position. That's not a bad place to be. But if you don't ask, then you don't even have a shot. There was a leadership um, position that came open recently. And um, my lovely Debbie Paul, we were, her, she and I were talking about this leadership opportunity and she had some reservations about it. I said, do it. Because if you don't get offered the position, you can't then negotiate your options. So don't put yourself in a position when it comes to networking to not even have options. You have to do something to then be able to decline something or you have to do something in order to be able to negotiate something. So it's very important to at least do it. And you can't do it without, uh, you, and you can't let hearing no um, hold you back. The other thing that being concerned about networking, um, being concerned about hearing no takes away from you, or takes away from the other person, is there are two jobs when it comes to networking. It's the job of the person that's networking, and it's the recipient. So if you want to ask me about opportunities in medical school, if you don't ask me, you've then taken away my job, which is to help you. So don't take away my job. It's my job to help you. If you don't ask, I can't help. So you are now hurting me by your fear of hearing no. So that's why you have to not be concerned with hearing no, because so many people are in positions to help you, but if you don't ask, then they can't. So you've now taken away their job. So don't do that. Let people do what their job is to do. It's very much like, and I, I know that you know, healthcare is extremely important, but if all the sick people in the world never went to the doctors, then the doctors would never be able to help anyone. If, you know, it, just, it, it wouldn't work. So allow people to do the jobs that they are in a place to do. You can also practice reverse psychology on yourself. Um, I, I did this in graduate school through an exercise where um, I had my partner, my group research partner at the time, um, we practiced hearing no with each other. We would ask each other no, or ask each other questions that would definitely be a no answer, but it was to get ourselves comfortable with hearing no, and then if we, every time we struggled with it, we would have to pay the other person. So we wanted to not be paying $2 every time we shrunk back into our shells for hearing no, so the more we paid, or the more money we paid out, the more comfortable we got. All right, well, she said no this time, but it was just an exercise, and it really just got us comfortable with hearing the word no. You're going to hear a lot more no's than yeses anyway, so it's good to get started now. It, you just might as well. You might as well Let's get started with it. And again, practicing hearing no. So somebody over here said, what do I say? I don't, that's my apprehension is I've got the people. I'm ready to hear no, but I don't know what to say when I get to them. 
what you say would be called the 30 second elevator speech. Has, have anybody ever heard of an elevator <coughs> speech, right? Okay, a good, a few of you have. 30 seconds, the idea behind that is you're on your way to an interview. You go into this big, you know, ivory building, you get into an elevator and you've got to go all the way up to the 17th floor. Now in that elevator next to you are people that look like they might be important. You've got 30 seconds to get up to that floor. How are you gonna sell your soul in 30 seconds, okay? <laughs> you're trying to make an impression. Um, the acronym that I came up with to help you achieve this 30 second elevator speech is called I'm aware. I'm aware. So the I would be your name, that's I, okay? M would be your major, year, and school. All of you should have no trouble saying where you go to school. Best school on earth, <laughs> Bloomsburg University. Best school. The A would be your aspiration. The W is what you have to offer. We're gonna put this all together, don't worry. The next A is ask for resources. Remember, it's your job to ask, it's the respondent's job to respond. Don't take away their job. Then um, the R is to restate your name and theirs. This is critical in networking, is to restate that person's name over and over and over. As soon as you get introduced, my name is Molly. Molly, nice to meet you. you you're just restate that person's name over and over again, over and over. And then E, the final E is to exchange information. <coughs> So we're gonna do this in less than 30 seconds. Again, I'm aware, and, that, and you may find that there's an acronym that better describes it for you. This is what I came up with. Um, I believe that it describes you being aware of yourself in this elevator going up to the 17th floor, 30 seconds, okay. So, who do I know? I know, an, I know a lot about Rob, so I'm gonna use Rob. <laughs> so Rob and I are in the elevator. I'm Rob Cole. Okay, so my 30 second commercial, 30 second elevator speech is gonna sound like this. It's gonna be a little awkward because you're not sure if you should talk to the person because they're looking at their phone, there's elevator music, you know, there's that American <coughs> standard of body space, but you're gonna try to do it anyway, okay? Hi, my name is Rob Cole, and I am a senior at Bloomsburg University. There, I'm working towards a degree in management so that I can become, Rob actually wants to be the president of the United States, so I'm, I'm just gonna throw that in there. Um, so that I can become a successful president of the United States. <laughs> Although I'm making a lot of progress towards my goal, I'm looking for support in the areas of uh, marketing. Um, is this an area you have any contacts, example, resources or information on? Great, thank you for the information about the internship that's open in your company. It was nice to meet you again. My name is Rob. If you don't mind, I'd like to leave you with a brief snapshot of who I am and where I'm going. I'll follow up, you, follow up with you very soon regarding the internship that you just mentioned. Thank you again for your time. Now that's wordy because I want to give you more rather than less. If your elevator speech is going to be a lot more casual. <coughs> but the, I just want you to have a script because once you put, see that, that hits on the entire I'm aware layout that's that's everything that was in it and, but yours is going to be a lot more casual but you have to be able to again give your name your major aspiration what you have to offer ask them for what you want restate your name and theirs and then exchange that information that's what you're going to do in 30 seconds okay it's your 30 second elevator speech the next thing that uh people had somebody had a concern about was who who am i talking to absolutely that's very important too because again your networking opportunities are gonna be unlimited, but knowing who to talk to, when and where. If you've only got 30 seconds and there's two people that look like you should be talking to them, how do you pick which one? <laughs> okay, once you pick, here's a, um, I'm gonna give you an acronym that I came up with um, that'll help you identify key um, individuals that will probably be able to help you meet your needs. Um, who do you all think are in your network right now? As Bloomsburg students, who do you count in your network? Anyone? Who's in your network? Faculty. Faculty. Oh my goodness, the most obvious. Who else? Students. Students? Yes, your roommate whose dad owns a business? Come on. Who else? Alumni. alumni. Thank you, alumni. I mean, these people went to the best school on earth. They can help, they're smart. They went to the best school on earth. <laughs> Who else? Alumni, so we got alumni, we got peers, faculty. Family. <clears throat> Family, yes, because you forgot that your aunt owns a carpet company. Okay, she's got contacts. Who else? 
Yes. Coaches? Coaches, yes. Absolutely. Who else? There's more people you're missing. Everybody. Technically everybody. Absolutely. Totally right. So I think um, narrowing those people down, um, you can put them into a few categories. I call them your rungs <coughs> on your ladder to success. I apologize. I, I am like an acronym fanatic. I mean, this, I, I just live by acronyms. They help me remember things. So on your ladder towards your networking success, who to add as a friend um, in your network would be your rungs. So relatives, somebody said family. Your relatives are more useful than you think. They are not only useful for that nice little graduation card at the end of the year, uh, or at the end of your four years. Your relatives have contacts that you don't know about. You know, their spouses have contacts. They have um, contacts within their own industry. University personnel, that's your you, okay? Neighbors. You see every day, and this was me, when I was in high school, there was this woman that, um, I lived in a cul-de-sac, and she was right at the start of the cul-de-sac, and every morning when I would be going to school, I would see her leaving for work, and the thing that I loved about her was simply what she wore. It's very, it's very insignificant, but I loved the way she was <coughs> dressed every single day she was going to work, and I would be riding in the car, riding past her house, and she'd be running out, she, she drove a, a Toyota Tercel, which is a very, very small car, but she always looked so amazing. And the combination of those two always intrigued me. I would think to myself, um, and it, there was no judgment, but it was like, she's got that itty bitty kind of like old car, but she always looks so fabulous. What, what does she do? It, it just, it always intrigued me. And I will tell you why that's significant in a bit. Uh, but she was my neighbor and I didn't know who she was. Essentially, I, um, I didn't know her. Um, but the general public, so as Ashley said, everyone, technically everyone is in your, your network. And then strangers. Strangers are only strangers until you meet them, right? Once you introduce yourself, they're not strangers anymore. So they're only strangers for until you do your 30 second speech. And others, down at the bottom I have, your advisors, university staff, coaches, friends, don't forget about parents of friends. You think about your own friends, but you don't think about their parents. Um, bosses that you have currently, like you may have a part-time job, um, your Facebook network, your LinkedIn, um, if you're a member of a church or a parish, um, the man in the garage at the Cheesecake Factory. So you guys will probably, some of you will, might remember this story from last year, but um, when my husband and I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, we, we did what we would, most of us would not encourage any of you to do today. <laughs> My husband and I, um, I got a job offer in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we had always wanted to move south. So when we got the opportunity, we're like, hey, we're going. So we sold everything that we owned, which wasn't much because we were fairly new graduate school graduates, sold what we owned, and we just shot down to North Carolina. And he didn't have anything. He did not have a job. Most of us professional staff would not encourage you to do that today. We would not say, just move down there with no job. But we did it, we took the risk, it was a huge risk. And the unique thing about the way we moved down there um, is I actually moved down to Charlotte three months before my husband came because he was a basketball coach at the time and he needed to finish out his season. So I had to start my job. So I moved down there, I lived in this little bitty studio apartment with an air mattress, literally, it was, it was just empty and I loved it because it was in Charlotte. And we lived down there the first night that he came to Charlotte, um, we went to the Cheesecake Factory. And if, as any of you know that have been to the Cheesecake Factory, you can never walk right in. Don't you always have to wait? There's always a wait, right? They give you a little buzz thing and you wait. So we are at this beautiful Cheesecake Factory and we're sitting outside and up pulls this yellow Lamborghini. And I am not into cars, so it wasn't a big deal to me. I thought the car looked cool, but it, did not dawn on me that it was uh, such a, a fantastic car. And my husband, he's like, what that car? And I was like, yeah, it's yellow. Who would make a yellow car? <laughs> it's so ridiculous. And he's like, that's a Lamborghini. And I was like, big deal, Lamborghini, I got a Jetta. You know, I was not, <laughs> I just wasn't impressed. And he's like, no, you don't understand. Like that car is a really, really big deal. So he, the, the gentleman driving the car gets out um, and there's a valet there, so the valet takes his car away, and the gentleman driving the car goes into the Cheesecake Factory, puts his name on the list, just like we had, is given a little buzzer, comes out, and the gentleman sits down next to us. 
And so my husband, um, being the master networker that he is, he says to the, he strikes up conversation with, with the gentleman. He's like, hey, um, how's it going? And the guy's like, oh, great. Um, really looking forward to my cheesecake. You know, it's a big deal. And then my husband says, yeah, me too. This is my first night in Charlotte. My wife moved here three months ago, and I'm just joining her for the first time. And he's like, oh, wow, that's incredible. And so my husband says, what do you do that has led you to this lovely car? I noticed the car you pulled up in. And the guy says, oh, well, I work in banking. You know, that's my industry. And my husband says, no way, my degree is in finance. You know, can you tell me a little bit more about your field? Because I'm new to the area. They end up talking so long, guess who went in and sat by herself and ordered food? Because <laughs> when it comes to food, I don't play. You know, it's just, there's no negotiation there. So I went in and had food. My husband comes in probably 30 minutes later with his new BFF. And they, he joins us with his partner too. The, the guy had a partner with him as well. So we just had dinner, the four of us. And that gentleman, he, did, he gave my husband enough connections that he was able to get a part-time job to get, situ to get situated in Bloomsburg. He had, not Bloomsburg, Charlotte. Um, he had no desire, Sarek had no desire to go into banking, but that wasn't the point. It was the opportunity that we needed. It's not about your, your ultimate goal, it's about opportunity. So he got a part-time job, and then very shortly thereafter, he ends up getting a full-time position with the university. But it was just a matter of being willing to strike up a conversation with someone that was a stranger. He was a stranger, right, until we met him. So we're still friends with him. Um, he's a really great guy, and he does. He just work, happens to just be an executive in banking, and he has a yellow Lamborghini. So it's a pretty cool story. Now, will that happen, will it happen that smoothly every time? Probably not. But you still have to be willing to take those types of risks. You really have to be willing to put yourself out there. Um, so the fourth apprehension was the people that said they were afraid of looking foolish. That was me. Remember, I, that, that was my big apprehension. I'm going to tell you what all goes into, how am I doing? You're good. Okay, what goes into your toolkit so that you don't look foolish when you start the networking process. We don't want anybody to look foolish, okay? We want you to be ready, have all the tools that you need. First is your 30-second commercial. Put that in your pocket. You got that. Then three letters of recommendation. So let's talk about letters of recommendation because this is usually where students learn the most. First, there are three types of letters of recommendation. A character reference, which is just me talking about how amazing Julia is. I'm just talking about her character. I don't know how Julia is in the classroom, but I know how awesome she is when she comes to talk to me. Character, so bubbly, so amazing. Great time management. Second is professional. That would be someone that has supervised you in a work setting. So I could also do that for Julia. She always shows up for work on time. Very, very committed. Never misses a task. Parents love her. Third type of recommendation letter is educational. That would be your faculty, the people that see you in class, see you showing up on time, see your group work skills. Sometimes you have one person that can cover all three. Sometimes you have one person that can cover two of those. That's fine. But in your toolkit, it is good to have three letters of recommendation. How do you get those? You have to ask. But you have to be specific in how you ask. Because sometimes individuals are not comfortable handing you a letter of recommendation. So you have to be ready for no. You have to be ready to hear a faculty member or a coach say, you know what, Leslie, that's not something that I'm comfortable giving you. But if you need a letter for a specific job opportunity, I will be happy to forward one on your behalf. Something like that. So know that when you ask somebody for a letter of recommendation, it is very possible that they are not going to give it to you. It's very possible. Don't feel discouraged by that. That just means that you need to build a bridge with someone else, someone that is comfortable. Now, let me tell you, if they say no, it is not personal. <coughs> well, maybe personal. You might have ticked them off and you don't know that. Um, but it could be because when you get letters of recommendation from people to put in a, just a general portfolio, just your, your, your little toolkit, some people are not comfortable having those open-ended. So you're going to use that a year later. Well, they don't know what you've done between a year and now. So if I'm very happy to recommend Sierra today and I'll give her this nice little letter just so that she can have it, well, if four months from now she pisses me off and then she uses that letter a year from now, I'm not going to be happy about it. Okay, so that's why some people are not comfortable doing this. It's not personal now. It just means, you know what, I'm not as comfortable putting my name out there kind of on an open-ended plane ticket where I don't know where it's going to go. Okay, 
So don't be discouraged by that. I still think you should ask because if you can get your hands on three letters of recommendation, even if they're three of the same, it's still good to have it. But I just want you to be aware of that. So when you're asking people for letters of recommendation, if it's for a specific job or for graduate school, do know that they are very likely going to send it directly to the person that it needs to go to. They're not going to hand it to you. And I go over this a lot with my owls. If they ask me for a recommendation letter, I say, okay, absolutely, we'll give you one, but I'm going to send it straight to the school because that's what's most professional. Unless the school says that the applicant should bring it in, which is very rare, very rare because they want to make sure there's no monkey business. They want to make sure you're not typing it up on your, on your own. So normally they want it to come directly from the person writing it. Always give people at least a six week lead time, at least. Six weeks, that's good because it's going to take them about two and a half weeks to get to it and then you want them to have time to mail it to where it's not cutting it too close. Always hand them a resume as well, always. <coughs> When you ask for a letter of recommendation, give them a resume too. Some people are going to ask for, ask for you to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them when you ask them. A lot of faculty will do that um, because they have so many people in their class and they may say, yeah, I'll definitely write you one, but let's sit down and talk about it first. And I even do that sometimes with students that I'm very familiar with because I may want to know more about their future plans. I know what you're doing right now. I know why you're amazing, but I want to know more about where you're going so that your letter can be as detailed as possible. A resume, for sure. Definitely want to have that. Um, we have right here on campus a career development center that will help you compose an amazing resume for sure. Resumes, cover letters, all that great stuff. Um, this is kind of optional, but I want you to have as much information as possible. It's also good to have a personal goal statement so that just in case you do get the opportunity to network with someone, if it's a really quick passing, you can send them an email and say, I know that we didn't get an opportunity to talk very long, Mr. Smith, but I loved meeting you at the Husky Leadership Conference. Attached you will find so that we can continue our relationship. And that gives you an opportunity to tell them more about yourself in a, in a time that you don't have. It also gives them a chance to read it at their leisure since everyone's time is very limited. Um, business cards. How many of you, I know at least half of your hands should go up. How many of you have business cards now? I'm looking for people I don't know. Okay. All right, well good, at least some of you. You absolutely, you absolutely should have business cards. Certainly your, your toolkit is not complete without a firm handshake. How many of you have ever sh shaken hands with someone with a wet noodle? <laughs> How was that for you? Very awkward, because you're going in all confident and then they let you down and you're like, oh, I oversold that one. <laughs> Doesn't end pretty, right? Don't have the wet noodle. Don't do this. None of that. You need to have a firm handshake so they know that you mean business. Look them in the eye. Okay. I taught my four-year-old to have a firm handshake, so don't let him beat you guys. And then certainly eye contact. That's just respectful and it definitely shows that you have confidence in what you're delivering. So this is your toolkit. This is what will prevent you from looking foolish whenever you go to network. This is it right here. Those are all the things that you need. Oh, and confidence. Also known as sweat. <laughs> so business cards, I asked about people having them. Um, you should have them. Every single um, owl, has, ha they have to have a business card. They are not, they have to have them on them at all times because they know that at any given moment they could be in a position to network with somebody. So I don't care if they're going, they do not block party. My owls do not block party. But in the case that they were strolling down the street while block party was going on, they at least have a business card with them. So, but the reason that most students are surprised when I tell them they should have a business card is because they think that they don't own a business. You do own a business, it's yourself. You are your business, sign, seal, deliver it. Like it's you, you are what you're selling. You are what you're marketing. So I just made up a sample one, like from when I would have been a student here. Um, I just have my degree information saying, you know, that I'm gonna be, I was a social work major. It goes over what my graduate school plans are, my goals, and it just very briefly <coughs> highlights some of my activities. It's very general, it's not fancy, but it's something that you can leave with someone that you just met. That's all, that's all you need. Something you can leave with them. All of the members of CGA have business cards. Um, it, it's just, you need to have a way to connect with people that's quick and it's instant. Sometimes you're just really quick meeting someone. I've met people <laughs> pumping gas, like, hey, I noticed you have on a, you know, Whatever, you have on a purple dinosaur shirt. I love purple dinosaurs. We should talk about it. Yeah, we should. You know, that's what, that's what your business card is all about. Um, I touched very briefly on this because I thought that I was getting ahead on my time, but the personal goal statement should be one page 
to the point and flattering. It does not need to be anything superfluous. It's just one page and you're just gonna have that at your disposal. It definitely has to be perfect and because it has to be perfect, don't be above getting someone else to do it for you. We have a lot of amazing writing students here at Bloomsburg University. Network with them. Network with them. Say, hey, I know you're great at writing. Can you tell my story on paper? In exchange for that, I'll help you with math. I'll help you with rush. I'll help, you know, leverage your skill sets amongst each other. I'm good at photography. I'll take photos of your next mixer if you help me with my personal goal statement. You all have skills. Share them with each other. You don't have money. You got skills, okay? I know none of you have money. None. <laughs> So if you don't have money, what do you, what's the next thing you do? You barter. I, I, I have a little bit of money, and I still barter skills with people all the time. I'd rather barter any day. I don't want to give up my money. <laughs> so you do that. So if there's someone, and all you, you're just going to sit down and tell your story to them and let them compose something that's beautiful, or compose it yourself, and then go to the writing center here on campus and let them help you refine it. We have a wonderful writing center. Let them help you refine it. Let a few people look over it. And I talked about the letters of recommendation already, so I'm going to hit on resume next. Um, resumes have to be perfect. They have to be. I am a fanatic about resumes. Fan fanatic. They, they have to be perfect. Resumes are so important that there are companies and individuals and consultants that make thousands and thousands of dollars a year doing them. This is, this is important. It has to be perfect. No typos. No first person, you know, no high school information unless it's something very significant like you're an Eagle Scout or something like that. Must be perfect. We have a career development center on campus that will help you write your resume. Come in there with a draft and we will work through it with you. But it has to be perfect and you should always have a, there's never a time where you should not have a resume ready to go because if you don't, the next person will. Sorry, don't want that to happen. Okay, so after you have done all of that and you get the very fortunate opportunity to make a second first impression, the next commercial I call is a Super Bowl <coughs> commercial. So, you know, your 30 second speech slash 30 second commercial, this <coughs> is the Super Bowl version. This is once you have now connected with the person and now you're going to follow up with it. So you're going to use whatever medium that they gave you, phone number, email, they, they're mostly going to give you email addresses. If they give you a phone number, um, you can use that as well. But you've got now got a contact from, you know, Joe the Schmo, and the Schmo has some pretty great opportunities. So you are now going to reintroduce yourself. I cannot tell you the number of emails that I get from people that do not even give their name. They just say, thank you so much. And I say, okay, thank you as well. They don't tell me who they are. It just says, oh, it's so great meeting you at the NASBA conference. Well, did we meet? Because I don't know your name. You know, you gotta tell me that. So reintroduce yourself, very important. Provide the circumstances of your meeting, critical. Mr. Lover Lover, I met you at the Husky Leadership Summit. Oh, Mr. Lover Lover says, that's right, I was there last Saturday, what a great event. Go Bloomsburg, you know? <laughs> that you have to establish that connection, remind them where you met, Emphasize your aspirations. As you know, we talked about my need for an internship in. You have to re, you, you, basically it's the 30 second elevator all over again, but you're re-emphasizing the same things. Tell them what you're going to do next because people don't like to be surprised. <coughs> Nobody likes surprises unless they come in small boxes, okay? Other than that, <laughs> you don't like surprises. Tell me if you're gonna call me. I don't want you to show up in my office. Nobody wants that. They don't want you to just show up and say, oh, remember we met at the leadership conference last week and you, you, you said you'd be happy to help me? I do remember that, thank you. I was not prepared to see you here. But I remember, don't surprise people. Tell them what you're going to do. I would like to follow up with you. Can we set up a time to meet? I would like to speak with you via Skype. I know that you're in Florida. Tell them what you're going to do next. Don't surprise people. Even phone calls can be a little off-putting and just, it just gets a little challenging with people's schedules, so you don't want to do that. And then remember, you always have to restate your name. Again, Kristen Austin, so nice to meet you. Just so that you can keep re-emphasizing who you are. And then it's always very customary to thank them for their, thank them for their time. 
Um, that's very important, but you have to make a follow-up. After you meet someone, you have that, that connection with them in the elevator, in front of the Cheesecake Factory, at the gas pump, at a program board event, at a conference, at a Dazzle meeting, wherever you are and you meet someone, follow up with them so that you can then establish that relationship. So this puts it all together again, just putting it all together. Good morning, my name is blank. Well, let's see. My name. I'm a big Bruno Mars fan, so we're gonna bring him in here. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Ms. Mars. <laughs> you and I met at the Adam Levine concert. It was <laughs> such a pleasure meeting with you, learning about the opportunities in uh, social media. As I mentioned when we, st when we spoke, I'm currently working towards getting an internship this summer via my degree in social work at Bloomsburg. You mentioned that you knew of some internships within eMarketing.com. To further illustrate my background, I am enclosing my blank, 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 whatever it is that you're giving them, and I believe these items give you a great picture about who I am. I will follow up with you via another phone call, an email, whatever the case may be. But you're just re-emphasizing everything. That's what you're doing right here. Everything you already did, you made the connection, now you're sealing the deal. So, from here, do know that we are all CEOs of something and you really have to determine what your something is. <coughs> you really have to, because we all are. I could probably go through this room and tell you what half of you are CEOs of but you need to know what it is for yourself. When I was a student at Bloomsburg University, um, I found out that I was kind of the CEO of editing, paper editing. I found out, that it, it became very clear that all my friends were bringing me their papers to edit. So that became my little, you know, my little hustle, so to speak. I wasn't getting paid, but that's what I was known for, and that's what you need to have. Something that you're the CEO of. I mean, you guys are good at such amazing things. I mean, you're here at Bloomsburg, that's just, that's, that's just mm -hmm. enough. So. Determine what you are the CEO of because that's going to be your big selling point. We all have people that we look up to, so ask them what they see in you. It's a big deal. Say what? You know, and you know, what is it? Even if it's family, cousins, what do you see in me? Ask your peers. Ask them what they see in you. That that is very important. And know that you always have something to offer. A lot of times I talk to students um, who just say, you know, I just I just don't know. I don't know what I'm here for. I don't know what I'm doing. And that is very, very realistic. It's very honest. It's, it's very much the truth. It's, if you know what you want to do, if you're here now and you already know what you want to do and you are set, consider that a blessing because it's not the norm. This is really about finding yourself right now. It really is. And, and it's okay if you are still finding. I'm still in school, right? Technically, I'm still here. <coughs> so I haven't left yet. I'm still growing. I'm still deciding what I want to be when I grow up. But just know what you have to offer. That's what's important. If it's really good listening skills, then that's what it is. If it's really good management skills, if it's fundraising, just know what it is that you have to offer because that's gonna help frame the direction that you go. Um, I do a different presentation. I'm not, it's not doing it right now, but also consider learning about social media um, networking because LinkedIn is huge. There is so much you can do on there. You can use Facebook too. Um, Facebook obviously has a little bit of a different platform, but there's still many opportunities to use Facebook for networking as well. But LinkedIn is really where it's at. So you, I mean, we could spend two hours talking about LinkedIn alone. Um, another type of networking to consider learning about is how to do so over a meal or at a dinner party or at a, or at a uh, cocktail event. Um, because you, as your careers progress, you're going to do a lot of that. So how do you hold the plate and shake the hand? How do you, when, when is the right, because there's a timing aspect to when you ask a question. If someone's getting ready to put a piece of food in their mouth, don't make them feel awkward, by then, then you have to stand there and wait. <laughs> don't do that to them. Don't put them in that position. So there, there are things to learn about how to network in a, at a eating um, environment. I talked about it at my table 11. Any table 11 in here? Okay, so I did talk about it, but there's, um, even when you're eating, there's, there are spe specific um, things to do when you're trying to network over a meal. So consider learning about that. We don't have time to go through it in here. But I'm, if I haven't made this clear, restate your name as many times as you possibly can because that person is gonna meet so many different people. So as often as you can repeat your name, just keep saying, again, my name's Kristen. Don't make it awkward, but you know, just <coughs> keep saying, it was so nice to meet you. You'll hear from me again. Don't forget my name, things like that. And this, these are just things to challenge yourself going out of here. I'm pretty much wrapping up right now. Um, 
cons really start to think about what you are the CEO of. Think about what that is for you. <laughs> because you all are the CEOs of something. Think about your business card. You know, what would you be putting on there as your specialty? What is it? Um, who looks up to you? Again, ask those questions. It's really nice to ask younger kids because they're so brutally honest. I thought I was so funny and then I asked my little cousin, I was like, do you think I'm funny? He was like, no, you are so corny. And I was like, all right. <laughs> Knock that one off my list then. <laughs> I thought humor was my strength. Um, also think, you know, again, this is a little bit redundant, but I just, I'm trying to word it differently so that it resonates with you in different ways, but what is special and memorable about you? What, again, what are your special talents and skills? What do you have to offer? <clears throat> and what is the nicest compliment you have ever been paid? That is your money. That's your money. Think about the nicest thing someone has ever said to you. You are so warm. You are so genuine. When employers ask you why they should hire you over the next person, that is what you want to think about. The highest compliment you have ever been paid. The one, that's, the one that made you stop and think, oh my goodness, you see that in me? That is what the employer wants to see in you too, for sure. And what to do now? Practice that 30 second speech, elevator speech. Do that every day. Just walk around campus doing it, mm -hmm. making new friends. Practice a Super Bowl commercial. You can do that weekly. Weekly, it's okay. And then get pe feedback from people that you respect. I'm doing this constantly, constantly. Just, I'll just say to my boss, oh my goodness, you know I just took on that new project. How do you think I did with that? Was that a failure? I ask the owl all the time, oh my goodness. Was that a horrible check-in we just had or what? You know, just you have to constantly be evaluating what you're doing so that you know how to better yourself. Please don't go with the assumption that you're just doing a great job. Because some people don't volunteer feedback. They're not just going to give you critical, con constructive criticism on their own. Some will, but, but not everybody is just going to say, you know what, your approach is really negative. Some people just aren't going to do that, so you may have to ask. And they've been waiting for you to ask. Like, Ooh, I would love to tell that person that. So give them an opportunity to do so and then be ready for it, too. Use the mirror for more than checking your looks. <laughs> Practice interviewing in front of a mirror. You know what else you want to do? Practice eating in front of a mirror. See what you look like when you eat. It's probably not going to be the, the picture you thought, but it will be good for, uh, it'll be good for you to note that every time you bend down to get your food, your elbow goes up. You may not know that. It's a little awkward, though, in a dinner setting. You eat in front of a mirror, you're going to be like, what in the? <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to happen. So check your looks in front of the mirror. Check your eating in front of the mirror. Practice your elevator speech. Do all of that. Do it in front of the mirror so you can just start to become aware of the nuances that you have. That it'll, it'll really help. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. And it'll make you better. And practice professionally praising yourself. We just don't do this enough. We just don't do it. And so when you go to an interview and the employer is saying, tell me some of your best qualities, you're so uncomfortable talking about how awesome you are that you struggle with what should be the easiest question. How awesome are you? You are awesome. You are a student at Bloomsburg University. It's amazing. It's amazing. Dr. Faye said when he sees Harvard applicants, he says, oh, Bloomsburg must have been full. Right, you know, good. I mean, they went to Harvard. Could have came here. <laughs> Silly people. So you need to practice being ready when someone says, tell me why you are such a great candidate for this position. That's the easiest question. Struggle with the one about philosophy and theory. That's the hard one. Tell me about your management theory. Oh, God, that'd be horrible for me. But if you say, tell me why you're awesome, it's not about being arrogant. It's about being confident, telling why you're awesome. So practice praising yourself. So sometimes I have to do this because I really struggle. There's one area of orientation I specifically struggle with. Uh, it's a very specific area. So every day that I get through it, I usually say, whew, you did a really good job dealing with that one specific dean that is very intimidating to you because you respect them so much. I have to literally talk myself through conversations with certain faculty because I'm so intimidated by them that I like, yes, absolutely, we have this, we have that, and then when they walk away, I'm like, 
Woo, good job, Kristen. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, I look around to make sure they didn't see me. So you have to do that. You know, practice telling yourself, oh my gosh, you did such a good job on that speech. You know, it started out rough, but you made it through. Practice doing that so that when, they, when the employer says to you, tell me why you're amazing, you can do so very easily. And then lastly, I said networking is not fast. It is slow. It is a slow, gradual process. So take small steps. Start with people that you already know. <coughs> ask them if you can practice with them. Make it slow. Make it easy. Um, and then it'll grow, for sure. Um, a lot of you, um, I finished right on time, which is what I wanted to do. You can actually practice networking with the people that are next to you right now. Um, figure out what you have to offer. I will tell you that last year when we did this, Marcus Bruce, many of you might know him, he graduated now, but I talked about people understanding what, this, what they have to offer. And Marcus, at the time, was trying to learn to be a photographer. He's very, very skilled. He's amazing. Um, and because I encouraged him to network with the person next to him, just to practice his skills, he booked a wedding. He booked a wedding. So the person sitting next to him was getting married that summer. And this was this time, this time last year. And he turned to him, you know, and I said, okay, practice your networking. And it just turned out, it, it just worked out well that Marcus was able to say, you know, what I have to offer is amazing photography skills. I'm a budding photographer. And the guy's like, get out of here. I'm getting married. We're on a limited budget. Perfect. Perfect for all. So Marcus shot his first wedding. The, the student is now married and he's got great photos. What, what more can you ask for? What can you ask for? So um, I am happy to answer any questions that you have, if you have any, or you can just relax and practice um, networking with each other.